thank you all. Uh, I'm going to quickly answer the question of the panel. Is democracy in peril? Yes. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> we appreciate it. Uh, but we will now explicate uh, a good bit. And I'm lucky to be here with three of my good friends and my mother, um, <laughs> as we've discussed. Um, what you're talking about? Everybody's heard that story three times. <laughs> Don't worry. Don't worry. And uh, I wore my sweater to sort of fit in as a tribute to dad. So, uh, so we're in good shape. Um, I want to start with Eddie, because uh, he's the fancy Princeton guy. Um, what values are key to the durability of a democracy? Hmm. What values are key to the durability of democracy? First of all, it's a delight and honor to be on the panel with each of you. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Um, so there has to be a recognition of the dignity and standing of ordinary folk right, who have the capacity to engage in self-governance. Has to be the rule of law, which allows for uh, the free exchange of ideas without punishment, it seems to me has to be a kind of basic moral contract uh, that sets in place uh, a set of obligations that we might have to each other that allows for some sense of community, uh, some sense of um, uh, relationship mutuality. Um, and you combine that with the, you know, the other abstract principles. I think it's important to kind of think about democracy in that way and not conflate it with liberalism, but we'll talk about that later. But that's what comes to mind immediately. Okay. Young Darman? I think about uh, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, who talked about if, a, if democracy was going to endure, it needed to be a living force. Um, and by that, he meant it needed to be the means by which people could expect that their government was attuned to their material needs, that it was a way of delivering justice, and that it was a force of spiritual ennoblement in their lives. And that was, I mean, he, he believed that very much, that government needed, that democracy needed to feel like it was alive. And, you know, the conversation that we're having today is democracy in peril. I think partly is that for, for a lot of us, it was just a word for a long time. And, and in fact, we should have been thinking about the fact that it was always a living thing and therefore always mortal. Right. So, Doris, I want to quote someone that you spent a lot of time sleeping with, <laughs> Abraham Lincoln. Um, he was great. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> that is what we call too much information here in the History Caucus. Um, Lincoln said, as I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master. That best expresses my definition of democracy. So talk about Lincoln and how he saw this in that era of immense division. And one of the things um, that Abraham Lincoln said in April of, of 1861 was that the central issue that had to be solved was whether a group of people, in other words, the Southern Democrats, could break up the Union simply because they did not win an election. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's so many echoes of everything we hear today. And if that were so, he said, then democracy would be an absurdity. So that idea of a peaceful transition of power was certainly one of the symbols of democracy. But I'd just like to follow up on your idea of a living democracy. In some ways, there's a very simple definition of democracy. When you look it up in the dictionary, it's a system of government that allows the people to vote in their leaders or throw them out. And I think what matters to that, that means that you have to have citizens that are active and involved and obviously in voting, one of the most important things they have to do and, and take that seriously, but also habits of, of citizenry. Um, there's a, a sense in which, and I, this is what worries me about today in a certain, in a certain ability, that, that people have to be willing to win with humility and lose with grace, which we don't see among many of our leaders right now. They have to be willing to somehow have empathy for people that are different from they are and understand their points of view. They have to have resilience to get through. It's the human qualities that we need as individuals. You know, your guy, Bush 41, his mother was fiercely competitive, and she wanted him to be fiercely competitive. But one day he came home bragging and said, I scored three goals in soccer today. And his mother said, well, how did the team do, dear? <laughs> and that was the important thing, that the greater good was more important than your own self. 
And again, that's what we need to feel today, that somebody cares about the country more than the party. So I think when we think of what democracy is, it's what our citizens are and what human qualities they're bringing to the task. Where did they learn these human qualities from? From their parents, from their coaches, from their teachers and from the examples that people in politics are setting, and I think that's one of the problems today, which we can get to. So, American democracy is, has always been a work in progress. Uh, I would argue, you know, we have this debate about whether we were founded in 1619 or 1776. I would submit, and I ask you all to uh, assess the validity of this, uh, that we actually are only about 58 years old or so, that 1965 mm -hmm. is the genuine founding year of our democracy because of voting rights, because of uh, Doris's man, LBJ, signing the Immigration and Nationality Act, a piece of the Great Society that doesn't get a lot of attention, but he signed it on Liberty Island uh, in the summer of 65. So to some extent, if I'm right, it's not surprising that this is as tenuous an undertaking, because we haven't been doing this in a multiracial, actually with an integrated electorate for more than 60 years. Does that resonate, Eddie? You uh, no, absolutely. I mean, if we think... Let the record show Eddie's never agreed with me. No, no, <laughs> <laughs> no I, think, I think this is true. I mean, it, 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 we have to insist that we haven't been a genuine multiracial democracy um, until 1965, and then barely then. Yeah because you have to understand 15 years later, just 15 years later, Reagan is elected in some ways to undo it. And we can debate this in, in Reagan country, I suppose, but this is, this is part of the challenge, right, we have to face. And this is a contradiction I think we have to, we have to kind of confront. It's a contradiction that haunts um, Federalist 51, 54, Federalist 54. Madison is grappling with how to count these people who are property from the very beginning. Right? You think about the second founding. What's at the heart of the second founding? What's at the heart of the American Renaissance in literature? Right? When you read your Melville, you read your Twain, you read and you jump to the Twain, you read your Faulkner. Right? So I think it's really important for us to understand that we have yet to settle that question, mm -hmm. which has been at the heart of of this fragile experiment. And I think this is really important, going back to connect the two. Democracy has to be understood as more than just simply processes and procedures. To quote one of my favorite philosophers, John Dewey, democracy is an ethical ideal. It's a way of life that involves a certain orientation to one's fellows, a certain assumption about our capacity for self-governance a form of life that allows us to actualize our talents in some ways, to become, to use Emerson's language, better selves in some ways, right? And that's been very difficult precisely because of the noxious and insidious views we hold about who should be valued and who should not be. And we're living in the midst of that right now. Tyree Nichols is being buried today. As we are enjoying this conversation, He's being buried today because some bodies are valued and someone, some other bodies are, genuine, gen, uh, are, are devalued or we, what we might describe as uh, generally disregarded. And that has a long history. Uh, uh, I can go on and on, but I won't because you will tell me to shut up. <laughs> Never. Um, John wrote a wonderful book uh, yes, some years ago about the pivot point between Lyndon Johnson and Reagan, uh, basically on the idea that 1964, vast landslide, but a thousand days later, Reagan's elected your governor. And so you have action, reaction almost instantly. John, put, put the democratic faith that you defined a moment ago as a character in, in a quick biographical sketch from that moment? What was Johnson's view of democracy? What was Reagan's and who's winning? I think that, well, I think of it really in terms of when I was working on that book, it was about the creation of the world in which I came of age. I, I, I'm, I came of age as someone for whom 1965, 1964 were the past. And when I think about the sort of shock 
of the most the last six years. It, it, it came in part from a, the naive assumption that it was a distant past. And that was the way we viewed a lot of things. Um, so when we, when we view David Duke's campaign in the 1990s, when we look at the, the white nationalism and the militia in that decade, when we look at you know, the early days of the Tea Party and birtherism even, we have a comforting idea that this is just an aberration from a path that we are certainly on. And I think that what we have learned over the last six years is that that's not necessarily the case, that we could fall back much further than we, than we thought, and that that was always the risk. Which goes to Doris's point, and Eddie, that this is an ethical undertaking. Mm -hmm. It's an ethos. So give us a couple of moments from your canon where we were about to fall way back, but we managed not to? Well, if you go beyond the Civil War, I mean, I think we definitely fell way, way back after Reconstruction and when Jim Crow comes in and when the troops are taken out of the South. And then there's a period of time in the 1880s. There's cycles in history. It's so interesting. Schlesinger wrote about it at the one point, and if we could only figure out how they work, because he kept saying they, every 30 years it's going to come back in the good way, and, and we've been waiting and waiting, and it hasn't <laughs> happened, happened yet. Right. But when you think about the turn of the 20th century, democracy was really at risk then. There was this huge gap between the rich and the poor. The, um, there, were, there were lots of immigrants coming in. There was a, a nativist ang anger about them being there. People in the country felt resistant to people in the city. They thought they were terribly suspicious and what were they doing? Teddy Roosevelt warned then that if people began to regard each other as the other rather than as common American citizens, that's when democracy would falter. And that's exactly what was happening in different parts of the country. And yet what happened is somehow he was able to, and it wasn't just him, the Settlement House movement had started, there was a social gospel and religion mm -hmm. that realized that we had to deal with the exploits of the Industrial Revolution and big companies swallowing small companies, tenements and slums, and the, from the ground up, that movement was there, progressive movement among the muckraker journalists, and you had that foundation that Teddy Roosevelt came in, and partly because he was an Easterner, a dude from the East, but he had gone to the Badlands after his wife and his mother died on the same day and he got so depressed that he went there for two years, but he became a Westerner, he became a cowboy, so he embodied all the parts of America inside himself. And that got us through that rational economic reform, social reforms that, that quelled the discontent. And then again what happens is then World War I happens, and then after World War I people are no longer as public regarding they want to go back to their private lives, and you have the silency of the, the 20s when it builds up again, the rich and the poor, and then the depression happens, and you get that New Deal generation, and FDR comes in. We've been lucky to have the right person. That's one of the questions at the right time. But something's welling up in the society at the same time, always. As Lincoln said, don't call me a liberator. It was the anti-slavery movement and these Union soldiers that did it all, and it was the progressive movement at the turn of the 20th century. And then you have the Union movement that's under FDR, and of course the Civil Rights Movement is under what LBJ is able to do. So I think when we look at turning back from a period of time which we feel is troubling right now, it is troubling. A lot of these other times that I've lived through are really, really troubling, and it gives me hope to think if we got through them, we can get through this. But this one's scary for lots of reasons, the lack of peaceful transition of power, the lack of, of, of facts that are being agreed upon by people in, in different parts of the country, um, and the disregard for the rights of other people. There's a lot that's coming together at one period of time, but I guess the hope that we want to get through is somehow old history has gotten us through before, and I still believe, we, we talk about this a lot, that it's gonna somehow do it again, but it's up to us. It's not gonna be up to the leaders. I, I don't, before my husband died, and he had believed in so much in leadership, he was with, JFK, he believed in LBJ during the Great Society, he was with Bobby Kennedy when he died, but one of the last things he wrote is we can't wait around for a leader. Mm. In a democracy, it's gonna be us, it's gonna be from the, the movements, it's always the movements, the anti-slavery movement, the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the gay rights movement, the, the environmental movement, they're out there and that's what we have to do. Mm. 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 You would agree with that part, even if the hope is less. Yes, I would, yeah. I, you know, I think, you know, it's interesting that often many of those, what you've just described, that would be described as the extreme left today. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. sure. That tradition that you've just outlined, that's the extreme, those are the extremists, right, in interesting yeah. sorts of ways. And when we think about the through line, 
of the history you told, even in the moments of the progressive era. That's the height of, of lynching in the United States where you have this extraordinary ritual where you have this strange fruit dangling from you know, magnolia trees and the like, as, 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 as uh, Billie Holiday sang about, right? And so there is this consistent contradiction that threatens to snuff out American democracy that has everything to do with this, this refusal to believe that diversity is a constitutive part of who we are, that somehow certain people possess the ideals of democratic life, that they own it and they can give it to other folks. And, and we have to interrogate what that means, right, and how that distorts and disfigures who we are, if that makes sense. It does. Talk about the conflation that we make, and I do it all the time, between liberalism and democracy. Yeah, so we often want to think about a certain kind of, uh, of rational individual, uh, the rule of law, a kind of understanding of social and economic arrangements that allow for individual flourishing in the pursuit of their own aims and ends, uh, and the kind of legal structure that enables that to happen. And so we will conflate the elements of liberalism with what democracy is, right? And so what's interesting today is that you know, even Brett Stevens is a liberal mm -hmm. <laughs> on a certain understanding or definition of liberalism because he assumes the background conditions. Don't panic. Right. Because okay. the debate between conservatives and liberals in the United States isn't a debate about the basic principles of liberalism, at least unless you're a Trumpist or something. Yeah. Because these are anti-liberals in a very <clears throat> clear and, and, and very clear way that they are. So, so, so there's this background assumption about the individual, about the rule of law, about the condi economic conditions that allow for the pursuit of one's own interest, aims and interests, right? And sometimes we conflate liberalism with democracy, that democracy's aim is to ensure the instantiation of those elements that we define as liberalism. As liberalism. And I want to say that those two things aren't the same thing. Hmm. S say more. Uh, why? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. You, I've, you've never had to tell a professor to say more and get any pushback <laughs> um, in the history of... I think it's important for us to make that distinction because oftentimes people will assume that advocacy for democracy entails advocacy for a certain economic system, advocacy for a certain conception or idea of the individual. Right. And those things, once they're conflated, can cause all sorts of confusion. Right. I think that's really important. I mean, when you think about voting rights, people not wanting to expand the right to vote, sometimes it feels like they don't want certain people to be voting. Mm -hmm. um, if you really care about democracy, you should want everybody to be voting that can possibly vote. Um, but there's some, there is some ideology that gets screwed up in there, oh, so absolutely. that if you don't want those values that the people who are going to vote for the majority are going to put into place, you don't want them to vote. Right. But you can't be a Democrat believer in democracy if you don't. Especially if you believe that, that only particular persons can, shall we, how can I put this, shall be accorded the benefits and burdens of citizenship. Right. Mm. Right. And there's always the question, whenever the question arises about whether or not these particular folk can vote, violence is always in tow. Right. So here we are in 2023, dealing with the question of the vote again. And that goes all the way back to Federalist 54. Yeah. How do we count these people in our democratic system? Mm. Or quote unquote democratic system. Yeah. So Doris, did you ever think? No. This is going to be weird. <laughs> <laughs> we were together uh, at Speaker Pelosi's invitation. Speaker, Lo Speaker Pelosi doesn't issue invitations, they're edicts. Um, <laughs> she's like Jamie. Uh, <laughs> uh, you just do it. Uh, she wears Manolo Blahnik. I don't think Jamie does that now anymore. But uh, uh, anymore. anymore. Um, so we were that uh, the one year anniversary of the insurrection. Uh, very moving occasion. Uh, the members of Congress who had been stuck in the gallery gave us these testimonies. That was. It actually started out it, like all of them were going to talk, and I was thinking you know, this is one version of hell. Uh, <laughs> let, let congressmen have a microphone. 
but there was a cumulative power to the to what it was. Uh, did you think you would see something like January sixth? No. As a historian no, and I a mean, citizen. No, I mean I think and I think what's even more troubling about what happened on January sixth was that at this time I thought mistakenly that it, it had drawn a line on our politics. And when you heard McConnell and even the, the, the current speaker now speaking about how it was wrong and that President Trump was responsible and we had to do something about it and we had to have a commission, and then somehow that all went away. The, even when we were at this celebration, um, Liz Cheney and her father, I think, were the only Republicans The there, only Republicans. The only Republicans who were there. This was a, a, something that happened to all of us, the attack on January 6th. Um, I, and I, I guess I thought it was going to bring about an arrangement of parties. John and I have talked about this, and again, this, you may think, what do we talk about crazily? But Charles Sumner in Massachusetts, when he was attacked by the Southern congressman from South Carolina in the floor of the Senate, it somehow was such a violent attack. It shouldn't have been. There were plenty of other violent attacks against anti-slavery people and against abolitionists, but this took place with a guy from the Senate, and he's a, a well-known figure, and it's in the Senate. And somehow that created, in some ways, the, the motivation for more people to join the Republican Party. And it began to, sh to shake up the party system. I thought that was going to happen after January yeah. 6th. And I think what saddens me more about that is that we're still arguing about what happened and the value of it and who was right and who was wrong and who were these people. And, um, and that should be something just like democracy, that we share a shared vision that that should never happen again. Yeah. So that's, that's what screws me up to think about it, even more than what happened is, is what happened afterwards, that it didn't make us come together as a nation to, to say this has to stop. And for, and for what it's worth, too, as Doris has written about, when Preston Brooks attacks Charles Sumner, he did it with a cane mm -hmm. that had a certain rubbery quality mm -hmm. so he could get more tension. He was inundated by commemorative canes mm. as a celebration of what he had done to kill Charles Sumner. And Charles Sumner, by the way, it turns out was right about almost everything. Uh, he was an egalitarian in an unegalitarian age. Um, even then, the capacity of illiberal forces within a democratic construct to campaign on, to marshal support for an illiberal direction was there. And I think it goes to Doris's point about it requires constant vigilance. Because even, even at that point, functionally, there was a Preston Brooks hashtag, mm -hmm. right? Um, Eddie, talk about the sixth, your reaction to it. It's a through line. It was a through line. Before the six, we had the attack on, on voting rights, voter suppression laws, uh, running rampant, uh, trying to limit who could vote. We had the debate around immigration, trying to grapple with who do we consider to be a part of the country, right? So there is a sense in which the, the, the demographic shifts of the country had thrown certain folks, certain forces into kind of feeling of terror and panic. And then when I saw January 6th, I was actually on, I was having a conversation about my book with Christian Amanpour. I was, I was on television live at the time. And then suddenly the images started happening and we just, and I was trying to make sense of it. And then you kept hearing, stop the steal, right? And you kept hearing, take back our country. And, and of course, at the heart of that was Atlanta. Hmm. It was stolen in Atlanta. It was stolen in Philadelphia. Fascinating. Milwaukee. Stolen in Milwaukee. Hmm. Right? Detroit? Detroit. Places in Nevada. Phoenix. Places in Arizona. Right? So, so part of what do we, so it was about who, who could, whose votes mattered and who, whose voices mattered. So there was a through line. And to me, so there's a through line from voter suppression to the debates around immigration to January 6th, the violence of January 6th to even CRT. So there's a question or a, a feeling of demographic, demographic replacement and historiographic displacement that is all part and parcel of the same thing. And there were just echoes of the post-Reconstruction period. 
just echoes of what happened with the assassination of Reconstruction, right? And that period, uh, that really dark period at the, turn of, at the end of the 19th century and the turn of the 20th century, that historians in African American studies would call, following Rayford Logan, the nadir, the lowest point in African American history in some ways. John, as the representative of the youth on the panel, <laughs> which tells you a lot about our demographic, um, uh, so if you were born, if you're voting for the first or second time in this season, think about what your lived experience is of the public sector in the United States. Right? So you're born, the attacks of 9-11, the WMD intelligence failures, the Great Recession, the rise of the Tea Party, a historic but ultimately not transformative Obama presidency, Trump COVID insurrection. Wow. So talk about people under 50, under 40, and their understandings of the possibilities and durability of democracy. Is it worth saving? Just to answer that directly, yes. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm, this conversation is me. I'm not generally in the habit of thinking about silver linings from January 6th um, because they're very, very hard to find. But if there's anything, it's that it awakened those of us who, who needed to be awakened to what was obvious. Eddie has very eloquently described how the threat of violence was always present in this illiberalism. And we saw actual violence drive that message home for us. And that, that woke us up, which is the fact that we are in the crisis. And, you know, if you think, I think a lot about, because I've just worked on it, Franklin Roosevelt in the 1930s. There's a, a famous story that starts appearing in the newspapers early in the Roosevelt presidency, um, where someone supposedly goes to FDR in the White House in the early days of his presidency and says, Mr. President, if, you're, if your program succeeds, you'll be the greatest president in our history, and if it fails, you'll be the worst. And Roosevelt corrects him and says, if it fails, I'll be the last. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that story may or may not be true. Oh, it's uh, too good to be true. It's got to be true. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's, like, it's like the Bible. Stories are always true. It's, no, no, no. It's like the Bible. It's true, but not accurate. But I think <laughs> the fact, what is true is it was in Dan the... Danforth knows this. What, what, was, what is true is it was in the newspaper a lot in the, in the mid-1930s. Interesting. And that means that people got it right away. People in the 1930s were awake to the fact that the republic itself was in a moment of mortal peril. Mm -hmm. And those of us here today are, just by participating in, the, in that conversation, awake to that fact now, which I think it was possible to get through a good chunk of the last few years with a certain amount of denial that we no longer have after January 6th. Can I just follow what you were saying? I think <coughs> that's right. I mean, the extraordinary thing that happened after FDR gave his inaugural address in which he told the country, he said, the people have not failed. It is leadership that has failed. And I'm here to provide that leadership. Mm. And the, suddenly there are headlines in the newspaper, the government still lives. Mm. We have a leader. And then my favorite story is that somebody wrote in to FDR. There were hundreds of thousands of letters that came into him just feeling like <coughs> he had changed the mood of the country because he was there. That's the magic of leadership. But somebody <coughs> said, I've lost my job. My husband's <coughs> mad at me. My dog ran away. My roof fell off. But now everything's all right. You're there. <laughs> I mean, right. how does that happen? We see it with Zelensky right now. I mean, it, I'm, again, I, we shouldn't be looking for the leaders because, as I say, it has to be us. But there's a magic when the right person is there at the right time and can mobilize that spirit that you talk about. Yeah. Yeah. What worries you the most and what gives you the most hope? Yeah. I, I think the, the most hope is that we've seen an uptick of young people voting in the last three elections more than, it's not just a, a blip. I mean, I, I was listening to some guy who studies the polls the other day. Um, that, that's a big thing. We've seen more women voting, more women involved in politics. I think that's a great thing. Um, and, and I think, um, I think 
you're right, Jonathan, that they, they, they're aware that something's happening in the country and that voting is important to do that. Um, what, what gives me the most worry is that when you think about young people and you want them to be entering public life, how many of them are gonna do so today? When what examples do they see? They see people in Congress that can't get along with each other, that call each other by names, that are not getting very much done. They, they see, they see um, bad examples that are being set as human qualities. And are they racing? I can't wait to be one of the generation, like the New Deal generation, or the World War II generation, or the 60s, when public lives really did cut across lives. So I hope that that voting is, is also gonna mean that they're gonna be active in their, maybe local and state communities before they go back into the national communities. But we need people to cross, the, and I, I think the thing that still scares me most is the, is the other business. The idea that people in the, in the two coasts feel differently from people in the heartland, that people yeah. in the south feel differently from people in the north, and they regard those people as other th rather than themselves. And that's why I still keep hoping, for, and John and I have talked about this, a national service program that could bring kids from high school before they go to school or vocational school or college to a different part of the country, the kid from the city to the country, the country kid to the city. They do something that gives them a sense of making a difference and they, they feel that sense of fulfillment that comes, it's what the military provides for people. If we had it domestically, I know it's a big bureaucratic hardship to figure it out, but I still keep thinking that's something that would give us hope. Mm -hmm. um, Professor? The most dangerous combination to American democracy has always been the combination of the loud racist and the liberal who's afraid that we're too that we're going too far. It's always been the case. And, I, and it's that toxic combination combined with greed and selfishness that historically and in our contemporary moment arrests change. The loud racist combined with that white liberal who believes we're going too far, and then suddenly we stop. And I, the, the image, that the person that comes to mind is Whitman. When we read the Leaves of Grass, you read the first edition, it's anti-slavery. He even has a character in the poem that shows how deeply offensive and monstrous he believes the institution of slavery is. But by the last edition of the poem, he's redacted all of that because Whitman believes he's an abolitionist, but he does not believe that black folk have the capacity to actually exercise the franchise. He writes in, in, in op-eds in Brooklyn that we were bar bar barbarians and baboons. So here you have someone against slavery, but still committed to this idea. Right? So those who believe that they're the loud ones, the loud ones that are the easy ones to condemn, and then those who think, well, we can't go too far. We just need to give them what they want, let them be quiet, and then we can go, I'm afraid that they're going to arrest change again. Because that's what's happened every single time, and to be honest with you, every single time it happens, we have to bury our dead again and again and again. I was raised in it, my son is raised, is, has grown up in it, and he will have to raise his children in it. Thank God, I hope he will have children, right? That's my greatest fear. Wash, rinse, repeat. My greatest hope? is us, us. And what do I mean by that? Baldwin says, that, and I'm paraphrasing him, paraphrasing him here, is that we have to understand that human beings are both sons of bitches and miracles. <laughs> we have to endure the fact that we're capable of extraordinary horror and pray for those moments where the miracle erupts and we can fundamentally change our way of life. So he says, in light of that reality, hope is invented every day, which means it's a blues-soaked hope. How do I swing my feet off the bed, plant them on the ground, and get about the work that's needed to bring about the new Jerusalem? So my hope is in us, in spite of all that I just said. Good time, good. <laughs> and now from a son of a bitch. <laughs> Or, or the miracle. miracle. Say something miraculous. Uh, uh, well, I think what gives me worry and what brings me hope is the same thing. It's the work that we all do, which is looking at the past. 
you can't seriously do this work and not have cause for worry. Because you, if you spend time thinking about this, you see again and again and again how close we have come to the abyss. And how if someone had not been there at the right time, we might have gone a different way. And beyond that, how many times someone wasn't there at the right time. We have lived in a country where we don't just work, where it's not a thing to worry about having rights taken away. They have been taken away. Um, so if you're going to honestly interrogate the past, you have to worry. But I also gain ultimate hope from looking at the past because over and over again doing that work, you were reminded that it's a human pursuit, all of this. We feel we are all very aware of our humanity and our frailty in comparison to some of the giants from our, in, from our past. But when you spend time with them, you see them as human beings. Um, and you know, I, I, in the last few years, I always come back to a line that Franklin Roosevelt said when he was running for president in 1932, which is, out of every crisis, mankind rises with some share of greater knowledge, of higher decency, and of purer purpose. I don't know about all of you. I don't see the greater knowledge right now, but I think if you are paying attention to the past, you understand that it emerges over time, and I have faith and at least hope that it can emerge for us. Yeah. We have time for a couple of questions. If you all have... Yes, ma'am. And you have to repeat it for the live stream, job. Everybody's got an opinion about how I should do this. <laughs> Didn't you have to say? Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Well, I'm sorry, tell me what you're afraid of. What they're being taught in school. Okay, so uh, to repeat the question, um, five great-grandchildren? Yes. Well done. <laughs> um, uh, so getting ready, some are getting ready to start school. Uh, what about curriculum and school and schools teaching them things that parents don't really believe they're they're ready to learn um this is why god created eddie I'm just gonna <laughs> <laughs> professor your thoughts you know i i think we need to be be mindful of of what our babies are being taught uh, as responsible parents as responsible grandparents and great-grandparents we need to be engaged in their education. We also have to be mindful of manufactured panics. And that is Christopher Ruf, Rufo decided, and he worked with AEI, I think, that what he wanted to do was to capture all the bad things that he felt emanated from the Black Lives Matter movement. And remember Black Lives Matter for a moment morphed from a challenge to police brutality to a broader question around the history that allowed for the devaluation of black people. And so there was a moment where there was a challenge around Civil War monuments. You remember this? In Charleston, in Char Charlottesville and the like, in New Orleans and the like. And so that question around history became very vexed. And so Christopher Rufo and others decided that they were going to capture all of the bad things that they associated with Black Lives Matter under the phrase critical race theory and say that they were teaching our children to feel guilty about the world in which they inhabited. And not only were they teaching our children this, they were teaching our babies this and they would find Ibram Kendi's children's books and this became the issue. And we saw it motivate suburban white moms in Virginia and Yunkin wins the governorship doing, exploiting fears and grievances and the like. This is my worry, y'all. 
Because this is not happening. It is, again, this effort. And of course, there's overreach. There are going to be moments when people try to do things that you just find, to be, what in the hell are you guys thinking? Right? And I'm a progressive, whatever the hell that means. Right? There, of course, they're overreach when we're trying to find our way to the next way in which we're going, the next iteration of our being together. But that panic is manufactured. It's not happening. Period. It's not. And we can go to the details. And we can argue the facts. Uh, so don't worry about your great grandbabies. They're going to come out great because you were great. They're going to be fine. One thing for what it's worth, um, and I've told Doris this. Um, so I published a book on Lincoln in October because he was undercovered. I was trying to <laughs> elevate a little bit. Um, <laughs> you know, just. He was slipping into Lincoln. obscurity, so he <laughs> needed some help. Um, <laughs> I was going to do Chester. Very grateful. I was going to do Chester Arthur, but there are too many books. Miller, Miller it, Fillmore. Fillmore, more fun. Fillmore, Fillmore. <laughs> William Henry Harrison, 31 <laughs> Days That Changed Typical America. Typical in time, um, too. <laughs> but I expected, as a white Southern male Episcopalian, every question out in the world to be about race. Mm -hmm. I got almost no questions about race for about 90 days. It was about the subject of our panel. The question, the first, second, and third question in audiences like this around the country, from Seattle to Florida, was how do we save democracy? Is this, are we in the 1850s? Mm -hmm. On reflection, I can see that it was kind of a canary in the mine shaft about what happened in the midterm. Right. That people were thinking about the Constitution more so than particular issues that would govern an ordinary kind of election. And I, I think that the suburban panics that, that Eddie's talking about, I know they inhabit a very respectable editorial page of a newspaper that I suspect y'all read. Um, I know there are issues, but it feels very 2021 right now. It could change again, but I do think there's a, one of the things that give me hope is that I think there is a, a seriousness of purpose, a seriousness of concern on the part of people who understand that we almost lost the Constitution. One more question, then we'll... If I could just add please. one thing to that. The first time that the people got a chance to vote, after January 6th to show how they felt about January 6th and the lack of a peaceful transition of power was the midterms. Yep. They voted in large numbers and they voted against election deniers and against people that were trying to, to, to undo the democracy. Yeah. Sir. You've all talked to us and written about leadership. And in the talks that many of us have been lucky enough to hear you talk about, you talked about the LBJ Roosevelt as human beings with their flaws and their idiosyncrasies. Not all of their views in today's perspective would be acceptable, or they might have this, not have the same view. Aside from the Confederate monuments, we've seen a wave of names being taken off buildings. In Portland, for instance, Woodrow Wilson High School, which James Ida B. Wells, wonderful lady. I believe she was a strong Baptist, and I think mm -hmm. the Baptist Church at that time, their views on homosexuality and other issues uh, were not those that would be put in effect today. It's so always better to honor a Baptist than a Presbyterian. <laughs> so uh, uh, I also think there's an arrogance that uh, in 50 years, I'm sure society then will look at the views that you all have and that we all have and find some criticism with who knows what. So if you were making the policy okay. on how local communities would deal with leaders that did many wonderful things but maybe had views which to, in today's perspective they sure. might not have had, those communities because what's happening is we're missing a national leadership that we're tearing down everyone who accomplished an awful lot at the expense of some views they have which today we wouldn't feel were appropriate. So the question more concisely <laughs> Are we out of time? and believe me it takes a lot for me to be more concise uh, is given the uh, the rethinking of monuments, not just to Confederates, but to 
more problematic figures like the Presbyterian Woodrow Wilson. Um, I guess that was predestined. <laughs> um, uh, so you can't do much about that. Um, I've always thought Presbyterians were like Quakers who sing, because if it's all predestined, where's the fun, right? Anyway, uh, wh what do we do about commemorating flawed figures? And if everybody's held to a 100% standard, will there be any monuments? Will we not celebrate leaders? I have a, a policy on this, but Darman, you start. I mean, I, as I think it's, first of all, a good thing that we're having these conversations, that what, what the goal of all of this is to take these figures out of the two-dimensional world where their names are on, up on walls and talk about them in our real lives. So this is a debate that we need to have and interrogating the past and saying, wh how, do, how do we apply the standards of our own time to the past, what is and is not a, a, a valuable set of criteria? I think that is an important and urgent debate in any era and I I'm, I'm look forward to the things that, that people 50 years from now find abhorrent in us. And it, it makes me think about the setting we're in right now. I mean, the last conversation, we're having a conversation about, um, you know, what, what books should be banned from libraries. I'm not really worried about the kids who are checking books out from the libraries. <laughs> I'm worried about the kids who are outside of the libraries. Mm -hmm. So the conversation we, ne we need to be having is really, is really that. Yeah. yeah. And I promise we will not take down the Darman monument. <laughs> <laughs> quickly. We, really quickly, we dealt with this at Princeton. Without Woodrow Wilson, Princeton would be a frat boy school, right? I mean, he made it into a modern university. And what happened is that the community had to get together and think about what, what does this man, what is the role of this man in the history of the institution? And understand his faults, his failures, his blindnesses, and understand that pr the Princeton of Woodrow Wilson isn't the Princeton of today. And so what does it mean for a student of color to come into the Woodrow Wilson School of Public Policy or the Woodrow Wilson dorm and see images of a man who believed that they shouldn't be there? So how might Princeton iter iterate itself, give voice to itself under different conditions? What does the modern Princeton look like? And so it has to make a choice as a community. And as a community, we did. Woodrow Wilson is central to our story, but we tell the full story of who Woodrow Wilson is. We named a building after Mo Toni Morrison. We took the name off of uh, the Woodrow Wilson School of Public Policy, but we still have the Woodrow Wilson uh, um, School, I mean, dormitory. So a community has to come together and think about who and what it is and make its decisions. Doris? I see to that. I, I agree with what you said, and I can't say it any better. Yeah. I, ha I have a quick test, which has had no effect, whatever. I propose it after every Confederate disaster, uh, and no one pays any attention, so you are going to be infli it's gonna be inflicted on you. I think the test has to be, were you devoted to an experiment in a more perfect union? That is, were you, in fact, if you're Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Eve Lincoln, even if you were not an egalitarian and a believer in the democracy as we believe in it, that's retrospective self-righteousness. So therefore, the conversation should begin with what was the totality of your contribution, including with Andrew Jackson. Mm. Um, I am very, and I grew up on a Civil War battlefield a thousand yards from the Confederate headquarters, so I'll put my credentials up against anybody here. Confederate monuments do not belong on public property in the United States. They do. I'm not going to tell you what to do in your house or your school or your church, or your museum. museum, your golf course, the Jefferson Davis links, you know, whatever you want to do. But that's a separate question. But on public land, people who wanted to end the experiment, I don't believe should be commemorated. And um, so the conversation begins with, were you for this journey? And, um, and it's vital to have monuments and commemorations that, as John says, remind us of these complexities. Because all these folks were men before they were monuments. And I'll leave you with this. I don't think there's anything more wonderfully American than the fact that Thomas Jefferson and Martin Luther King Jr. now stare at each other in perpetuity across the tidal basin. That's what we should be. Thank you all very much. Thank you all. <laughs>